Hey guys, it's been far too long since I've seen you all, and I am excited to announce a podcast meetup in 2024 here in San Jose, California. And I'm super excited to announce that I'll be co-hosting the meetup on February 22nd with Justin and Aaron from the Generation Y podcast. Yep, the boys from Kansas City are coming to town to meet you. Mark your calendar to come out, have a drink, take some pics, and talk true crime with us at the V-Bar at Hotel Valencia on Santana Row in San Jose. Get all the information in the show notes or on our website, truecrimepodcast.com. Follow our social media for updates and special announcements as we get closer to the date. Links to all our social media channels can also be found on our website. We can't wait to meet you. This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. This is our last episode of 2023. I can hardly believe that the year is about to end and we'll celebrate a new year in just a few weeks. But before we do, we must wrap up our year in true crime for 2023. To help me do that, I've invited several special guests to the show. I've asked some of my best partners in crime to tell us what their true crime highlights were this year. I also asked them to share the case that most intrigued them in 2023. In this episode, you'll hear from podcasters Tyler with Minds of Madness, Michael from True Crime Guys, Leroy from Excuse Me, That's Illegal, Jerry from FBI Retired Case File Review, and Eric with True Consequences Podcast. I'll also share the most exciting things that happened for Once Upon a Crime in 2023 and tell you about the true crime stories I was most obsessed with this year. So without further ado, here is our true crime wrap-up for 2023. My first guest is Tyler from Minds of Madness. Tyler has been producing his award-winning true crime podcast since 2017. There are almost 200 episodes of Minds of Madness to date, and I've been a fan and loyal listener since episode number eight. I'm happy to call Tyler a good friend. I've had the pleasure of collaborating with him on an episode of his show and a live show we did together at CrimeCon UK this year. Here's my conversation with Tyler from Minds of Madness. So I just want to say welcome to Tyler from Minds of Madness. He is another one of my partners in crime. You guys know him. His you know, show is one of the top rated shows. It's been around and uh, he has done some amazing things. And I just want to say welcome. First of all, Tyler, I don't even think I said that the first time. So welcome. <laughs> the first, our first day that wasn't recorded. <laughs> exactly. But it's all good. Now we know what yeah. to say. <laughs> you know exactly what to say. Why don't you tell, ask me about all the things that happened in the Minds of Madness this year? So we're doing a year in true crime, year in review for 2023. And Tyler, the first thing I want to know is what are the big highlights for Minds of Madness in 2023? I have to say the biggest thing that happened for us was we went weekly and I left my day job of 26 years. So I am now a full-time podcaster. I was a telecom technician for 26 years and doing both jobs for, well, six and a half years, uh, two full-time jobs was just too much. And we decided to take the show weekly and now here we are. And I, uh, I get to spend my day in my new studio that we built um, in the backyard and we call it the bunker. Uh, it looks yeah. like the bunker. It definitely looks like a bunker. It does look <laughs> Good. But that's awesome, though. You know, you just got a few steps to your to your place of work, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so weekly episodes. Quit weekly your day episode. job. By the way, I didn't even know you were still doing a full time job. So that's amazing. You made it look like you were doing this full time. It's amazing <laughs> how many podcasters I talk to, and I'm like, oh, I'm still doing my day job. 
And they're like, what? <laughs> so I, the, the second thing I want to ask you is what case or cases stands out for you? Now, it could be something you covered. It could be something you heard about or something you've just been following. But I'm really, we uh, listeners really want to pick your brain as a true crime podcaster. Like, what are the, the case that really resonated for you this year? Well, we certainly did cover it a lot more than I'm used to covering because, of course, we're doing it weekly. And it seems like I'm recording a new one every other day. Um but the one that stuck out to me the most, and it's such an obscure case, um, a guy named a guy by the name of Peter Keller, and he was living in North Bend, Washington. And this guy, this story is nuts, and it kind of harkened back to the interest in, for me. Of course, was when I grew up, I loved building tree forts. I loved, like, I had to build forts. You know, we had a pool table in our basement. I used to line it with all the cushions from our from our couches down in the basement. And I would pretend that that was my, that was my fort and I would hang out in it. I think I even slept underneath it for a couple of weekends when I was a kid. So forts was always a big thing. Um, came across uh, one in the, in the forest across the street from our house. And I guess some kids had started building it. They built the platform and brought all the wood and dragged it out there, but then just abandoned the project. And me and a couple of my friends, we actually built it and uh, used to hang out there all the time. So forts was always a big thing. And I had read this book when I was, a, when I was really young, it was called my side of the mountain. And it was about this kid, like young, I think he was like under 10 or maybe around 10 and he runs away from his family. And I think if I recall correctly, now I remember seeing the movie when I was older and it took place, the movie was shot in Toronto and in, in Quebec. So he runs away into the mountains in Quebec and finds this big giant tree that's hollow, hollowed, you know, it's 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 formed so that there's a hollow cavity in it. And he he burns the inside of it to create this, this little house, you know, to clear away the wood. And the whole story is about this kid living off the land and he's got a i think he's got like a falcon or something that he trains or he's got a bird and i was like that is so cool and so there's elements of this peter keller case that comes into play here i've always been fascinated 2015 um a guy named elton mcdonald i believe his name was he was a young carpenter and in 2000 around 2015 um, Toronto police were alerted to this to this tunnel that had been built in uh, Parkland um, around the Black Creek area of, uh, on the north end of Toronto, and they were calling it a tunnel. And it was right across the street from the York University campus. Actually, I think it was close to where the um, I think it's the Rexall Center where they have uh, sporting events and stuff is there. And they're wondering what what's going on with this tunnel and. Anyway, so it's it was built. It was like, I don't know, six feet wide. You could walk into it. They had built like these rafters in it. There was even a generator with electricity going into it. But I mean, it was still pretty rough. It was, you know, this dirt captured the the, the imagination of, of Toronto. Everybody's wondering what the hell was going on. Turns out this guy, he was building a man cave, like a hangout place. And, and there was even a police... Uh, did a press conference on it and everything. So that kind of stuff, it's always been, you know, I've always been kind of interested in this. And I, I'm always amazed at the boldness that, of people that go on to uh, public property and they go and they build these structures or, or in, you know, in these cases, the digging in. And, and they're, they're like, what do you expect you're going to do with that? You know, it was just, it's always just puzzled me. So this Peter Keller case, he's, uh, He's got a, a wife, Lynette, and, and uh, a 20-something daughter, uh, Kayleen. Um, she's in, she's, uh, I think she just started college. They moved there. Perfectly normal uh, family man. He worked at a computer refurbishing uh, company as a technician. He, he was very active with the family. Like, he was always the guy that did the entertaining, the dinners, and stuff like that. But here's the crazy thing. Eight years prior to the event. Now we know when we do episodes and stuff, and when we do a script and that, we don't refer to to uh, to the actual bad part of the story that happens. We refer to it as the event. Um, eight years prior, Peter was he was an outdoor 
enthusiast. He was a bit of a survivalist. Uh, he certainly liked guns. He had a lot of guns. And he gets it in his head that he's going to build a bunker in the side of Rattlesnake, um, Rattlesnake Mountain near, uh, near where he lives. And for eight years, he's going out to this secluded spot in the mountain near a stream uh, way off the beaten track. You would have to be lost on the trails to be able to find, you know, to even stumble upon it. It was so remote. And he would, you know, come home from work, have dinner with the family, and then be like, see ya, I'm going off. And he didn't tell his family where he was going, and nobody knew. He he didn't tell anybody, anybody about this bunker. And it's nuts to think, for eight years, he continued to do this. And his family didn't even know. His friends didn't even know what he was, his coworkers. Nobody knew where he was going. I can't even go to the grocery store with a Beck not saying, hey, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm going to the grocery store. This guy, he was, he built a 250 square foot bunker in, in 20 feet deep to where he hit bedrock and then poured a, like a concrete base into it. So it was a half hour climb from the, from the parking lot of the trail, like the trail's head, up to where he was building this bunker. And he was lugging like 50 pound bags of concrete Holy crap. up this mountain. An Iron well, Man co- and a Gun no competitor or something. No coincidence it took him eight years to build it. But the finished product was a completely camouflaged uh, area. There was, you know, like a trap door that you climbed down the ladder. And, a, and he had like a, a, a stovepipe coming out somewhere because it was heated by, by a wood stove. But... 200 square 250 square feet and it was he had he had completely stocked it with food candy pop um guns a lot of guns a lot of ammunition and here's the crazy thing when they when it was all said and done and police were actually searching the bunker they found tens of thousands of dollars stacked in in piles in this in this bunker so anyway you know, halfway through the story, you learn, well, he's built a sleeping area, but it's only for one person. You know, so, you know, what, what is this guy going to do? And, and, and the tragic part about it is, is he, he ends up shooting his family and setting fire to the, uh, to the house. Oh and God. yeah, and he's got it rigged. He's got it rigged with gas cans throughout the house. He puts a plastic uh, like the the plastic, you know, the red plastic gas cans, and he puts one on the on the on the stove, and I guess or or on a heating element, and turns it to high so that it would gradually melt the plastic, and then poof, it would set off, and then the fire would continue going through the house and setting off the other gas gas canisters. But here's the crazy thing: he does a video diary while he's building this thing, oh. and then he figures, you know, I I always it always boggles my mind about the people who keep diaries, and especially when they're bad people to keep diaries. And so instead of doing what I would consider the intelligent thing to do was take that hard drive you've got all that information on and take it with you to your bunker. No. Or self-destruct it at a certain time and place. Yeah, yeah, he's, got a, he's got a safe in the house, and he builds a pipe bomb and puts it beside the hard drive with the door open in the safe. So he figures fire is going to happen then it's going to hit it pipe bomb's going to explode blow up the blow up the hard drive but if it doesn't though yeah so they had yeah they had a neighbor that was was on the ball and saw the smoke and realized this is bad called 911 the fire department was in there within 6 minutes um mm-hmm. brought the flames out it hadn't gone upstairs they found the hard drive and you know then they piece it all together and yeah <laughs> But uh, great story. I'm not going to tell you how it ends because you should listen to the episode. Rattlesnake Ridge, the Keller family murders. So, okay. I will definitely be listening to that. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on. It's so fun. And um, it's always fun to talk to you. You know, it's been great to watch, you know, how much, you know, Minds of Madness has taken off and how people have found it and how, you know, it's it's just, it's just an amazing show. Tyler, thanks so much. Oh, have a great day. Thank you so much uh, for having me. And uh, we will talking soon yes definitely
One of my favorite people and podcasters is Michael from True Crime Guys podcast. Michael is truly a talented individual, not only as a true crime podcaster, but also as a musician and, dare I say, a very gifted voice actor. He's also really funny and fun to talk to. He and his co-host, Andy, consistently release new episodes of True Crime Guys as a podcast and a YouTube channel. He also has a second podcast called Sandu Stories that blends true crime, the supernatural, and audio theater. You'll definitely want to check that out as well. If you haven't yet been introduced to Michael and True Crime Guys Productions, I'm happy to be the one to bring them to you now. Welcome, Michael from True Crime Guys. Uh, Michael's been in the true crime game probably about as almost as long as I have, right, Michael? Almost, almost. I think you were at it about a year uh, before we got into it. I think we we started, well, technically we started in 2016, but then we rebranded at the beginning of 2017. Oh, um, that's what it was. So, yeah, so January of 2017 technically is when True Crime Guys started. But we started, uh, me and Lauren started True Crime Las Vegas in November of 2016, I believe. And okay. we quickly quickly realized uh, we wanted to cover a lot more cases than just Vegas cases. So we went ahead and swapped it up before anybody knew who we were. <laughs> <laughs> you probably have seen all the changes that have come uh, as much as true crime has blown up, you know, yes. in the last five or six years. Um, yes. Who knew, right? <laughs> when we started yeah. this. I mean, we, I mean, you kind of felt it, but I just didn't think that it would become this mainstream, I guess. Uh, it's like having a true crime podcast is not enough anymore. I mean, obviously, you you have went to YouTube as well because, yeah. um, you know, that was something that me and Lauren always said from the beginning. We're like, no, nah, we're not doing YouTube. We're not doing YouTube. <laughs> we're like, it's just too much extra work. We don't have the time. Um, yeah. But the industry has kind of pushed us there, honestly, yeah. uh, finally. I wish we would have started years ago, but here we are. What? This year in 2023 was the case or cases or something that you really paid attention to, really caught your attention in 2023 as far as true crime. Okay, uh, the first one it has to be, and it's and it's uh it's also our best performing video on YouTube as well. Um, but for me, it was one of the hardest cases to cover. It really was, and it's uh, the Vera Joe Rigel story. Are you familiar? Um, there's no. a documentary called Good Night Sugar Babe. Uh, mm -hmm. it's a few, I think it's a few years old. I'd say it come, probably came out around 2010 or so. Um, mm -hmm. very disturbing documentary. And it's basically about a young girl who was abused at home and she was, you know, a little bit slow mentally. Um, she was, she had other special needs and whatnot, but, and her father was abusing her. Her stepfathers would abuse her. So at 19, she met this 13 year old boy that she went to school with and I guess he was a freshman she was a senior she had been held back a year and she went to go live with his family and his and her parents were like yeah whatever you know do what you want so she goes and lives with this family and lo and behold the whole time she's basically being held hostage there like her parents think she's staying there on her own free will right because she's 19 and she is actually being held hostage by this this boy his brother's and his mother, who ends up being like kind of the ringleader of this horrible, twisted family, who is basically like they're basically keeping her as a sex slave. They're beating her. Um, and basically her whole job was to give this boy's mother, Sugar Babe, another child, another grandchild. And that's what she wanted. And which is even more twisted because this woman was a known pedophile who somehow just kept, she just kept, it's it's a very aggravating story. It really is. She just kept avoiding the police because she just lived in this slum area of Ohio and the police didn't want to go there and they just didn't want to bother with it. And the whole thing escalated and, you know, they end up taking Vera Joe's life in just one of the most awful ways someone could ever pass. And that case has just stuck with me. And, you know, I joke about it on the show all the time, how, how how limited my memory is right it's like if it was if it was two weeks ago it's already gone i've already i'm already downloading the new case i'm already getting stuff ready for this week um but right. this case is unfortunately this case sticks with me and uh oh yeah it's it's brutal i highly recommend if, if you're in if you like a uh, hard to listen to true crime that's that's definitely one 
Um, but that's, that's what's frustrating with me sometimes. It's always these cases that blow up, right? I don't know if that's good or bad. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I think there there is there is definitely that. I think you're right. There are those cases that stick with you because, um, you know, you and I, we do multiple episodes a month. And mm-hmm. so sometimes you'll forget, like, I mean, by the time it goes out and people are asking you about it or maybe they ring it up, I'm like, what which one was that? Like, exactly. I can't remember, you know? And I can't remember the name. It's terrible. And but some yep. of them you do, you you just don't shake them, you know, and yep. I really do feel like this is one of the ones that I've been kind of noticing in the last year or two is that the ones that have to do with like family units, you know, uh, because it's almost like a, it's almost like its own cult, right? It's almost like its own yeah. closed system. And so this dysfunction not only stays, you know, in this, this home or with this family or with this expanded group of people, but it almost kind of like escalates because that's what they know. And it, and it, and it like, it progresses to be even worse. Like the, 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 either it's abuse or, you know, something like that's going on where people are being deprived in some way or abused in some way. And it feels like, because it's this closed unit, it's, it's accepted to the point where other people now become like accustomed to it. And now they join in or it gets worse or, you know, and it's just, they're horrendous, these, these cases. And I've done yeah. several of them. Shelly No Tech was one of the ones that I did. People really resonated with that one. It was one of those mm-hmm. those kind of things. Um, you know, the Turpin family in, in California with, with the 13 kids and, you know, the, right. the horrific abuse that was going on there. I'm in, and I've done several of these and people do re, re, uh, recall those, but I think it's because of the level of, of just the, the horribleness of the crime. But also I think mm-hmm. it's because these are these closed units, these families, and, and I call them like almost like a, like family cults kind of things. Almost. Right, right. I think they're a little more, I think they're also a little scarier because they're a little more relatable to a lot of people, right? Mm-hmm. Like when you hear Vera Jo Rigel's story, you don't have to grow up in a home like that to know, well, I went to a school with a kid that had a lot of those same tendencies, you know what I mean? Or, or I, I, you know, I visited a friend's house and it was, it kind of gave off these vibes, you know what I mean? And so it kind of like, it makes, I don't know, I guess it makes people feel a little bit closer to the crime and it makes them feel a little more terrified, especially when it happens in these, you know, in the middle America, like in these right. small towns that, everyone's been to and whatnot and everyone lives near um i think that's what it ups that that terror factor like a chris watts case right like how many families do you know that took pictures i mean look at their facebook pictures look at their family photos it's like that's terrifying because you know people who are in relationships like that right maybe you've taken photos just like that and it it makes it more more real i think the relatability does and i think that's partly why those cases do so well when you cover more modern cases and you get, you know, security cam footage, ATM footage, 911 calls, you know, all that, it just makes everything a lot more realistic, yeah. um, which reminds me of another case, uh, the cough syrup killer. This was, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think this was the first case that me and Andy hosted together. Um, and it's uh, about a guy named Matthew Phelps, who wasn't, I think he was 20, 22, something like that, newlywed. And basically kills his wife in the middle of the night and then blames it on cough syrup, says he drank too much cough syrup and blacked out and he must have killed her. Um, But yeah, that case uh, just in in what makes it so memorable, I guess, is like I said, there's there's body cam footage of the police, right? Interviewing him, walking in through the house. Um, Mm -hmm. There's tons of crime scene footage. There's tons of interviews of him, um, interrogation footage and whatnot. And then when you hear him talk, he just he just seems and sounds like any other person. Like they were avid members in their local church, right? The the young couple who was just bought a home, started a family. Like they seemed like they had everything together. Everything was perfect. And then one night he snaps and kills her, like stabs her to death. It's just Yeah. It's terrifying. It really it is. is. But so anything coming up for true crime guys that uh, that you're excited about in 2024? Really? Yeah. Just uh just focusing more on uh, YouTube, uh, starting to incorporate more in our videos and whatnot. Um, 
we're really focusing most of our energy towards that, towards creating the shorts, creating the YouTube um, and building a, a basically building a whole new audience, because in a way we're kind of we kind of feel like we're building a new brand because the dynamic is so different now uh, mm -hmm. with myself and Andy. And I think people are kind of starting to get it. I, I noticed that we've been getting more positive reviews lately. We we're basically going to be building the YouTube and also working more on uh, Sandu stories, which is what we absolutely love to do. Um, and if you guys are unfamiliar, Sandu Stories is basically our audio theater podcast. Uh, we have one season out now, and most a lot of season two is available on Patreon. And uh, but we're working we're working on that all the time, behind the scenes, getting new uh, you know getting friends and family and other podcasters in to do voices. And uh, speaking of, I'd love to have you do a voice, Esther, on oh, one of those good. episodes. Yeah, yeah. so. I'll reach out it's to like you in the future. Like action chops. No. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I know, yeah. Are you still doing the, mu the music for the show? Because I know you used to do different songs for the show. Yeah. Are you still doing that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to do that. I actually prior prioritize that more now. I actually try to, uh, I try to do, like I did a little jingle for uh, Alec Murdoch. We just did yeah. the Alec Murdoch case. Um, so I felt like I had to do something for that one. It's just such a big case. And uh, but yeah, at least every other episode, I try to put out a song and I've been releasing them, too. Um, I released a bunch of music on Spotify and Apple Music or YouTube Music. It's it's out everywhere. I had some of my favorite ones from way back. Oh, my gosh. Was it uh, Jody Arias? I love. That one. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. That was yeah. one of my all time favorites. I used to have that, I think, on my ringtone for a while. It was just so <laughs> funny. I used to laugh every time I heard it. It's, it's, so it's crazy. I always, everybody always brings up Jody and uh it's just so funny to me because honestly it was like one of the easiest songs for me to write because it's it's just a chord progression and a rhythm that I've played a bajillion times right and I was just I, it, that that was one of the first ones I wanted to do it was the first ones I did one of the first songs I ever did I literally wrote that whole song in like 20 minutes I'm not even joking and I've yeah. worked so much harder on so many other songs that no one remembers Jody is available if you guys want to listen to it. I released it on an album called Truths and Tragedies. Um, and it's uh it's wherever you listen to music. So we'll wow. definitely put all the links in the in the show notes too, so you guys can catch all that stuff because that's uh it's really fun. It's it's something totally different, you know, like that you will get from right. a true crime podcast. But thank you again. I really appreciate it. And I wish you all the best of luck in 2024 and moving forward. I'm sure Absolutely. you guys are gonna do great. So yeah, thanks so much, Michael. Have a good day. Before introducing my next guest, I'll share Once Upon a Crime's year in review. I thought this year was going to be a fairly quiet one. I didn't have a lot of travel on the calendar or extra events, but to my surprise, Quite a lot happened in 2023 for me and for Once Upon a Crime. In February, I made my television debut. Last year in June, I filmed two episodes of a new series for the History Channel titled History's Greatest Heists. The show debuted on February 7th, and I was featured on Episode 1, The Antwerp Diamond Heist, and Episode 3, The Baker Street Bank Burglary. Seeing myself on national television was very exciting and a little nerve-wracking if I'm honest. But one of the most exciting things from this experience was seeing my name right next to the host, Pierce Brosnan's, as top cast on my IMDb page. And no, sadly, I did not get to meet Pierce. On the downside in February, I also came down with a case of laryngitis that lasted for weeks. I sound slightly different on a few episodes released in March and April. I've mostly recovered now, I think. In April of this year, I was featured on two episodes of HLN's true crime show, Very Scary People, hosted by Donnie Wahlberg. And no, I didn't get to meet him either, but I almost interviewed him for the show. I appear in Season 5, Episodes 1 and 2, which covered the Trailside Killer case. That was also a great experience, since I'd covered serial killer David Carpenter, a.k.a. the Trailside Killer, in depth on Once Upon a Crime. You can now stream Very Scary People on Max or Amazon Prime Video. In June, I traveled to London for CrimeCon UK once again. 
Once Upon a Crime was nominated this year for the Outstanding Episodic Series Award at CrimeCon UK's True Crime Awards Ceremony. We didn't take home the top prize, but we were honored to be shortlisted against such stellar podcasts as Generation Y and Red Handed. While at CrimeCon UK, I was honored to present a live show with my good friend Tyler from Minds of Madness. It was so much fun to be in front of a live audience presenting a true crime case with Tyler. We also produced a collaboration episode released on both Minds of Madness and OUAC on January 11th titled The Long Con, The Murder of Mi Quen Chong. In July, I went Hollywood once again, filming an episode of the new true crime series on Oxygen titled The Real Murders of Los Angeles. The episode I appeared in, Season 1, Episode 8, is titled Murder on the Menu and aired just this month on December 1st. That was an amazing experience, and I absolutely loved working with the producers and the crew of that project. Are there more TV appearances in store for me in the future? Who knows? (laughs) But I feel like I'm starting to get the hang of it, and it's been such a fun experience that I look forward to it again if it happens. I also had the privilege of interviewing a few true crime stars who I definitely fangirled over, including Erin Moriarty from 48 Hours and author Harry McLean, who has written some of my favorite true crime books, including In Broad Daylight. Finally, Once Upon a Crime hit a huge milestone by releasing our 300th episode in October of this year. I can hardly believe it. It's been a lot of work, but also a lot of fun and I have all of you to thank for Once Upon a Crime's continued success. I look forward to many more years hosting this podcast and the amazing opportunities it brings. Have you ever had a gut feeling about something? You're listening to a true crime podcast, so I'd venture to guess that at least once in your life, you felt an uneasiness in your gut. Maybe when you were in a dark parking garage, or when you heard a floorboard creak in the night when no one is stirring in your house. Hey, I'm not trying to freak you out or anything. I'm just saying, listening to your gut can be a good thing, to be on the safe side. There's a good reason to trust your gut. Your whole body's health starts there. When our gut health is out of balance, it can cause many problems. Due to health issues in my own life in the past, I've learned to be diligent about paying attention to my gut health. Our new sponsor, Seeds, DSO-1 Daily Symbiotic, is a broad-spectrum prebiotic and probiotic that benefits your gut, skin, and heart health and delivers more of what you need where you need it. I've been taking Seed every morning when I start my day, and in addition to the improvement I've experienced in my digestion, I'm also excited about how it's formulated to help promote my fitness and cardiovascular health. I've got new fitness goals for 2024, and Seed's DSO-1 Daily Symbiotic supports my body's ability to break down fats and lipids and maintains blood cholesterol levels already in the healthy range. Listen to your gut with Seed's DSO-1 Daily Symbiotic. Go to seed.com slash once, that's lowercase once, and use code 25once to get 25% off your first month. That's 25% off your first month of Seed's DSO-1 Daily Symbiotic at seed.com slash once. Code 25 once. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp, the world's largest therapy service providing professional, affordable, and personalized therapy online. We're in the thick of the gift giving season. Christmas is just around the corner. Maybe your holiday gift shopping strategy is to start early and you already have your gifts purchased, wrapped, and ready to go. If so, well, goody for you. No, really, that's great. But I'll be real, I don't know what that's like. Or maybe you're like me, and you enter the hordes of shoppers at the mall on Christmas Eve day, and don't emerge until your feet are killing you, and your back is sore from lugging shopping bags. If so, I sympathize. But seriously, whatever your gift-giving strategy is, it's so important to remember to give to yourself. Life can be stressful, so make sure to set aside some time for self-care. Whether that's snuggling up with a good book, or your sweetie, or starting therapy. We can all use a little support sometimes, and the holiday season can sometimes create stress or leave you feeling a little blue. You might be dealing with family stress or financial issues, or you just want to start talking to someone about your goals for the new year. Talking with a therapist is a great way to get the support you need. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. 
BetterHelp is designed to be convenient and suited to your schedule. It's entirely online, and you can get started easily by filling out a brief questionnaire to be matched with a licensed therapist. In the season of giving, give yourself what you need with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com once today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash once. My next guest has been a frequent collaborator of mine on the show. Leroy Luna, host of the podcast, Excuse Me, That's Illegal, is one of the funniest guys I know, and we always have a great time. He was my co-host in April for the series April Fools, and it was so much fun that I had to bring him back again. He's here with me today to help wrap up his true crime year and discuss one of his favorite cases in 2023. So with that wonderful introduction I just did, <laughs> here is Leroy from Excuse Me, That's Illegal. And I just want to welcome you. And you guys know him. You guys know him. He's been on the show before. He's he's a regular. We'll put it that way. Uh, but yeah. Hey, Leroy, how's it going? Oh, just super. How, how are you, Esther? It's always great to, to hang out with you. I'm glad you invited me for this year end type of show. Yeah. Yeah. No, it always is. We always, you know, have a, have a good time and there's always something strange that comes out. While we're talking. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. 2023. I don't know. It, it was, I mean, we've had stranger years, I would say. Um, 2020 was, of course was really weird and 2021 was not much better. Um, but okay. Now we're a couple, you know, a couple years past that. I don't know. It, 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 to me, it felt like there were some things that kind of like stabilized and normalized, and there was other things that kind of went completely, you know, wacky. So, um, you know, just generally, just in the world and, uh, you know, in the news, there's just all kinds of things that just seem strange this year. But what I want to know is as far as uh, your show, Leroy, excuse me, that's illegal, like what was there anything that kind of stood out for you? Was there anything special that happened in, you know, your life or the life of the podcast that uh, was something to mark this year? Um, well, my numbers have gone down a bit. I haven't really. Sp <laughs> I wish I had good news, but <laughs> I haven't really negative. spoken. <laughs> I don't really talk to people about their numbers that much. So I don't know if it was just a me thing or or what happened, but they yeah they've gone down a bit, and um, I did hit. A uh, pretty big milestone, I guess, for me, which it's not something to be that proud of, but it a uh, hundred episodes. Oh yeah, um, <laughs> it just means I've done a lot of episodes at this point. I guess I'm a, I'm a <laughs> grizzled veteran. They don't have to be quality, but I got the quantity, the the numbers up there. Uh, so yeah, that's been cool. So okay, continuing on with you know 2023. So of course we want to talk about true crime because that's what we do. That's where we make our bread and butter here. And um, what stood out to you or what was anything, you know, any true crime stories or cases or, or you know, things that maybe even you covered on the show, whatever you want to talk about that uh, really stood out for you as far as true crime in 2023? Well, uh, you caught me off guard with that question, Esther. Uh, I didn't know we were going to discuss true crime here. Um, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I I know a lot of people that you would talk about probably, you know, there's the the University of Idaho students who were murdered by that creepy dude or the, the Alex Murdoch trial or the, uh, the bridge guy uh, finally being identified in the Delphi murders that Richard right. Allen. So that, that was a huge one. I'm sure people are are talking about. But, uh, you know, me, uh, I'm a petty crime guy at heart. <laughs> So it's the uh, lesser known, less dramatic, but equally as interesting, at least in my opinion, uh, cases that get my motor running. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I actually have a case that, I, that I'd like to talk about that, um, yeah, it's piqued my interest over this year. Um, that is Bonnie Gooch, which uh, she has a fun name. I like to call her the Gooch. The Gooch. Uh, I was going to say that she must be called the Gooch. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, she's someone I've obsessed over this year. Uh, she's just she's a sweet looking 78 year old woman who stands slightly under five feet tall. So, you know, very unassuming. And uh, her story happened over in the small town of Pleasant Hill, Missouri, uh, April 5th of this year. On a Wednesday afternoon, she walked into a bank and she was wearing sunglasses and she had a pair of plastic gloves on. 
and uh, one of these N95 masks. She walks into this bank and approaches the teller and slips them a note. Uh, I wish I could have seen the look on the teller's face when they read this note from this little old lady because <laughs> it read, this is a robbery. I need 13,000 small bills. Sorry, didn't mean to scare you. So, um, yeah, she asked for 13,000 small bills, not 13,000 in small bills, but 13,000 small bills, which, you know, uh, you guys have ones. We, we have the loony and the toony over here. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I guess she could have meant ones and twos and fives, right? That's that's going to be a lot of money to get from one teller. Yeah. So, yeah, she asked for this money. And um, the, the teller's nervous, obviously. And they're trying to get this money together. And it's, it's not going quickly. So the gooch starts to get frustrated and starts banging on the counter and saying, Hur hurry up. Don't bother counting it. Just give it to me. And, uh, Why she did she getting... enumerate that she wanted 13,000? <laughs> she... yeah, ex exactly. I guess, she... you know, she okay, thought hold this on, would have... did, she say, did she say she had a weapon or... No. No, she... no weapon? No weapon to okay. speak of. So, yeah, I'm thinking in my head, if, you know, if you were the cash, if you were the, um, the cashier here, what, what would you do in that case, do you think? Would you be handing it over or be like, are you sure you want to do this? Like you could just walk away and not get arrested or, or something like yeah, that. Right. I'm picturing like the, the, the grandma from the Tweety Bird cartoons, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> or whatever. Like, that's what I'm picturing. I'm like, I'd be like, maybe she's just confused. Like, you know what I mean? If she, <laughs> I don't know that I would right away unless, you know, there was actually some threat. Yeah. Know? I mean, I'd probably just give her the money and, you know, <laughs> hope that maybe she gets away. <laughs> it's up to the cops. It's, it's not up to me, right? Good but, story. Uh, you anyway. don't, yeah, you don't want her getting to swat you with her purse or something. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I guess this wasn't going as quickly as she thought. Because you want to be in and out of there in a minute. You're asking for 13000 in small bills. That's going to take, take a bit of time. So um, witnesses said that, you know, she she getting getting that wad of cash and walking out. And there were some witnesses that said she got into her uh, vehicle. It was a Buick, one of these big boats. And it had a handicap registration tag <laughs> that you could see <laughs> through the windshield. I guess she parked in the handicap spot right out front. Uh -huh. That's that's one of those rough things when you're an old person uh, robbing a bank. The getaway is much slower. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine. So, um surveillance footage they got her license plate they got all this stuff and uh, it didn't take long for police to catch up with her about two miles down the road at a veterinarian clinic uh, she was just chilling in the parking lot so uh, when the officer approached and said you know get out of the vehicle and he sees this tiny old lady step out he, he said he thought he might have had the wrong person but then he saw cash scattered all over the floorboards <laughs> in the car and he could smell uh, the strong aroma of booze in there. Oh, there you so, go. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, not sure if the gooch got into the hooch uh, to celebrate <laughs> after the robbery or or she needed some liquid courage beforehand. She probably a bit of both, <laughs> right? <laughs> I'd, I'd say so. <laughs> um, so, yeah, obviously she got charged with stealing from a financial institution. And there was a lot of commenters on this story. Um they were on the Gucci's side saying in America, they don't take care of their elderly. I hear that a lot in Canada as well. Um, she needed cash and this was her best option. And I, I guess worst case scenario, she gets caught and at least she gets taken care of with the meals and the shelter. And, and maybe if she has health issues, they, they kind of have to deal with that. Right. Um, yeah. Or if she gets away with it, you know, she's got a good chunk of cash. So it's kind of win-win. Nothing to lose what you're saying, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But um, so, yeah, that's how it seemed. But there was a little more to the story. There was more to this lady than met the eye. She she actually uh, robbed another place three years earlier. So she was still 75, still pretty old. But she asked for three thousand dollars that time. And uh, she would have got away if her, her son actually ratted her out because uh, she left. She left their home uh, with a BB gun and said she was going to rob a bank. And um. So he was worried about her safety. So he kind of ratted her out for that one. And she received uh, like a year of uh, supervised probation for that one. Oh. And um, 
even still, that wasn't her first bank robbery. We find out that uh, over in your stomping grounds, kind of there, Esther, uh, she robbed a bank in California back in 1977 when she Jeez. was 32. Like she was only She's 32 a career, back then. A bank robber. Yeah, that's her deal. Yeah. So this wasn't really a desperate old lady. This was uh, something she's done at least three times. And you would hope she didn't get caught every single time, right? So I, I think she's she's done it more than that. Yeah. Uh, there's the 80s in there. Like the 80s were a wild time. So I'm sure she pulled off a couple of robberies in the 80s. Yeah, maybe she got but... away the ones she didn't get caught for. I mean, it seemed like it'd be a long span in between, you know? Uh, yeah. I mean, unless like they like... The first one she had gotten away with a lot of money then maybe you don't need it but if you know there's so yeah it's kind of like they say like with the uh, with like serial killers right or any kind of serial crime it's like they don't stop it, it's if there's like gaps in between maybe they just didn't get caught you know yeah those true things. or i mean maybe she stopped when she was 32 but now she's getting kind of old and senile she kind of she needs money she's she's going back to her roots from yeah. what she did in her past i don't know, know. Yeah. you go back to what you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah but uh, anyway i did i did a story on this one um just three weeks after it happened back in april so she was still awaiting trial and all that so uh this was one i i yeah i gave a lot of thought to actually as, as silly as it is i i was thinking about the gooch and, and i was hoping she didn't get you know they didn't throw the book at her this was her third time getting caught it could be like a three strikes kind of thing um right. And even at 78 years old, I mean, you get a five-year sentence. That's almost a death sentence anyways, uh, right. de depending on what kind of shape she's in. Who knows? Right. But um, so, so do yeah, you I was know, curious. Like, when she got arrested, was she being held? So she's, she was in jail this, you know, while she's waiting trial? Uh, her, her bail was set at $25,000. So mm -hmm. she was able to pay that. Not with the bank robbery money, I guess. Maybe her son or something. <laughs> So I, I actually, this was bittersweet because, um, you know, I, I found an update in the news here and um, in July. So I got the update I desperately craved and um, <laughs> the gooch. So she was out on bail and officers knocked on her door on July 26th of this year. It was at 2 p.m. And they're going to serve her the arrest warrant, get ready for her trial and all that. And um, uh, they the door was unlocked and they they smelled a bad odor. And uh, oh, no. unfortunately, they found the gooch deceased in her bedroom. And they said oh, foul wow. play was not suspected. And I guess you could say the gooch avoided jail, but she couldn't avoid the reaper death. Uh, none of us can, I suppose. It's kind of a morbid way to end it. But <laughs> yeah, that's the tale of my favorite bank robber, uh, Bonnie Gooch. Oh, yeah I a say, lovable um, woman maybe not my favorite rest, bank robber i mean there's some yeah. some cooler ones out there i guess but <laughs> rest, in peace, rest in peace to the gooch yeah yeah that's good well she kind of got away with it i mean i guess in a way i skate yeah anyway. um yeah it's too bad i don't know yeah <laughs> um yeah seemed like a cool person someone i would like to interview or something you know Sure, she had some stories. <laughs> so who got a who got a possession of Tweety Bird after she was gone? I wonder. Oh yeah, good question. Probably her son, her doting son, who ratted her out. So. <laughs> yeah, no, it sounds like she probably had some kind of. Uh, I don't know. Just, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just kind of guessing here. Like maybe she had some kind of alcohol problem, right? Yeah, I mean, it's only a problem if you. Um, I don't know. I think it's a problem. <laughs> if, she... <laughs> if it, affects... yeah, I guess it does affect her. It makes her do weird stuff, probably like rob banks. Yeah, Although, yeah, yeah. That's and wh where where was this bank robbery at? The last one. Uh the last one. It it was in Pleasant Hill. It's like it's like a town of eight thousand in uh, Missouri. Oh, Missouri. Oh, okay. So, but yeah, her first one was. In... Her first one was in California. So, I mean, she's she got around, right? Yeah. I don't know. She, I guess she thought, okay, move to Missouri, you know, quieter, you know, maybe more affordable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, man, I'm I mean, so you... bored. I just got to go rob a bank. <laughs> yeah. Like... That's also yeah. not a good idea to rob the bank of a small town that you live in, right? 
a town of 8,000 yeah. people where probably everyone knows each other. Mm-hmm. And you're this little old lady. Only, but... the, is that only the only bank rob, robbery story that you... Weird bank robbery Because they seem to be pretty weird. We they are. Do one, didn't we do one before last year where it was... Uh, they're dressed as nuns or something. Was that right? Yeah, that rings a bell. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I that do was that one. There's a lot of because bank robberies are very common, like um mm-hmm. the small time ones, right? Not where you're trying to get into the safe and all that. Just people right. going in there getting a couple thousand dollars, or I think that's what I heard the average is maybe two thousand dollars you would get from a bank robbery, which you know rob a liquor store yeah. or something, you'll yeah. get the same amount, and it's probably that's easier. Probably, it's probably easy because I'm like, I don't know, do people even get away with bank robberies? It doesn't seem like it. Right. Um. Yeah, that's a hard one. Espe- and especially if you have a weapon, like a gun or something, you're, you're going to do some pretty significant yeah, time. So she didn't have a weapon, we don't think. No, she didn't have a weapon in the one she was. And oh, the other one, her son said that she was leaving with a BB gun, but um, I don't think she used the BB gun or yeah. that would also be kind of weird. A little old lady with a BB gun. <laughs> I mean, I would just so run want- away. I'm just thinking you. OK. I'm I'm a teller at a bank and this lady comes in and she obviously is an elderly woman. She's by herself. There's not like some big guy with her or something. She hands yeah. over a sticky note or something and, you know, very apologetically asks you to give her this money. I just don't know why you do. <laughs> why yeah. you give her the money? What's going to happen? On the, on the teller, right? You could be like, hey, this lady's trying to rob me. And uh, yeah, they could figure it out. Uh, I I think you know if you, if somebody comes in very threatening, um, you know something like that, you might of course panic. My my sister was a teller at a bank uh, briefly, like way back, um, and while she was while she was working there, uh, some guy came in. He he jumped over the counter. He pushed because there were girls working there, you younger girls. I remember because that was my bank, and that uh, pushed you know pushed one. You know she kind of hurt herself against the the counter or something and then uh i think i'm pretty sure he had a gun or so, or said he had a gun or something and then just started making them open the thing and started grabbing the the you know the money and walking out now i can i can see that like that seems like a bank yeah. robber you know that's <laughs> dramatic yeah. like a bank request to withdraw yeah. funds <laughs> i know i'd feel like oh if i had 40 <laughs> bucks in my wallet i'd be like here just take this you know uh, i guess she wanted more though i mean she had she had a a dollar amount in mind you know thirteen thousand or that's 13, the other thing i wonder about that doesn't seem that seems a little odd like that's also seems like off like there's some kind of uh glitch in her thinking like why and it's not even worded correctly like thirteen thousand dollars in small bill why thirteen thousand that i mean i could see ten thousand or a round number right makes yeah. more sense yeah you know and how long did you think it was going to take she's pounding on the the counter like 30 seconds later like uh i don't have that just on hand i would have loved to have an interview with her to see like well what was she thinking that's that's yeah yeah, or, yeah. yeah it sounds like there's something they're a little off there but you know that's that's true of most of your stories there leroy so yeah <laughs> true with oh, me too. i am a little off as well so it's uh <laughs> these are fun fun to search out for sure yeah. especially yeah the bank robberies you're right. They are weird. This one guy so, did it. He was just trying to get away from his wife. So he actually, I don't know if I, uh, we might have talked about this one before, but he robbed the bank and then just sat in the lobby afterwards because he wanted to just get away from his wife. Like he wanted to get oh, caught. Oh, that's right. I remember that. Yeah, I remember yeah. that one. I was going to say, the one thing I was going to say is I thought you, I thought where, where you were going with this story was that when you said that she was just sitting in the parking lot of the veterinary's office right veterinarian's office i thought oh it's gonna be some heartwarming story she needed money for her dog because her dog her cat was sick and oh she, yeah i you know, see that would have been <laughs> that would have been great but that, been great. that didn't happen if, if, yeah if that was a movie that would make sense but real life yeah. often isn't you know doesn't work out that well yeah so, just having a parking lot where she could like grab her fifth of whatever she was reading. Yeah. <laughs> just the closest <laughs> parking swig. lot i guess swig. <laughs> counter money it's going everywhere like oh uh, my yeah. gosh she robbed a liquor store <laughs> would have got right. away with some 
some booze and everything. Yeah, yeah. I got both. Yeah, booze and money. There you go. <laughs> Except liquor stores, I don't know. Seems like they they have weapons behind the counter a lot of times. I don't think I'd I'd chance it. Yeah. So, yeah. This is uh. This was Missouri too. I don't know what the the gun laws and stuff are over oh, there. Very <laughs> loosey goosey. <laughs> Yeah, that's when being a old, little old lady might benefit, though. Like, who's going to shoot a little old lady in the back or something? Um, yeah. So that might have worked to her advantage. Yeah, that's possible. Yeah. Odd. We, we like them. We like those stories, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, totally. Yeah. So what was it about specifically about the story that really is it just the whole scenario of it? Or is it? Yeah, I think the fact that it was a little old lady just kind of not tugged at my heartstrings but it just uh it was different right it piqued my interest kind of I, I was rooting for her it's one of those <laughs> things and uh yeah i, I was hoping I, she wouldn't rot in i jail. noticed that on your show sometimes it's like you're you are rooting for the criminal <laughs> the criminals yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is why yeah i don't have this is why i'm i'm good covering the petty crimes because yeah uh, i could stir up some controversy if someone murdered someone and i'm on their side you know um yeah you know the guy kind of had a point <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah exactly he had a rough childhood you know give him a break yeah. wow <laughs> <laughs> so anything anything coming up uh in uh 2024 do you have you plan that far ahead because i have not so <laughs> i have not <laughs> <I've>... ideas from... <laughs> yeah i wish i was one of those people who was you know some people have their next 10 episodes planned ahead Usually I put yeah. out the episode, I chill out for a few days. Uh, you know, I wait for people, the emails to come in, people telling me how great it was. You know, I, I, I just bask in that. And then I'm like, oh, crap, I got to do another story. And then I'm, I just start Googling weird crimes or, you know, I, I got a few lined up usually in my back pocket, but I'm yeah, kind of, who knows, right? Um. So once again, I just want to thank you, Leroy, for coming on the show. It's, it's been great, like it always is. And uh, of course, tell people once again the name of your podcast and where they can find it and all that good stuff. Excuse me, that's illegal. That's excuse me, comma, that's illegal. Uh, you can find it wherever you find your favorite on demand audio. I think I'm everywhere. I, I'm pretty sure. You know, okay. at least the. Also, the and, you, and if you guys are, 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 a, are a fan or will become fans of his show, I highly recommend you join his Patreon because he's got a lot of good stuff over there. Uh, a lot of these off the, uh, off the cuff discussions and uh, oh, you're doing the death row things, right? The death, yeah. death row. Yeah. Those, those I have are an cool. obsession with uh, last meals for some reason. And uh, <laughs> you know, I go over the crime and the last words and yeah, me and my brother it's, I don't know. I enjoy, I enjoy those for some reason. Yeah. Uh, and you just, I think, I, think I just saw another one pop up on my feed. So I'll be, I'll yep. be listening to that. <laughs> like, <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's to totally worth it. I would, I would definitely check out his Patreon, but uh, yeah, thanks again. I appreciate it. And uh, Merry Christmas, happy new year, uh, 2024 coming up, man. I can't believe it. And hopefully I'll be seeing you at a crime con or something in 2024. Yeah. That'll be cool. Yeah. That would definitely be cool. I would love yeah. to go to one of those happy Hanukkah, happy holidays. Uh, yeah. You know, all those do we Merry cover all the bases all right leroy thanks so much okay yeah thanks for having me my next guest jerry williams has an impressive resume and is multi-talented she served for 26 years as a special agent with the fbi working major fraud investigations before retiring. But retirement didn't slow her down. She started her second act by becoming the author of two crime novels and a nonfiction book, dispelling the myths and misconceptions about the FBI. And she still had time to launch a podcast in which she interviews retired FBI agents about their most high-profile cases. To date, she has over 300 episodes that cover real-life FBI investigations into bank robberies, child abductions, serial killers, and other crimes told by the agents who work to solve them. In addition, Jerry is one of the nicest women I know and took time out of her very busy schedule to talk with me for this episode.
I'm pleased to share Jerry Williams with you on the podcast. I am very excited to talk to my friend, Jerry Williams, um, author, podcaster. Her uh, podcast, like I mentioned in the intro, is FBI Retired Case File Review. She always has a lot going on. Plus, she's she, like I said, she's an author. Um, so I just want to say hello and welcome, Jerry. Hi, Esther. Thanks for having me on. So this so the first thing I want to know, because I know I get your newsletters and I see your social media and I know you always have something going on, plus all of the great interviews you're doing um, on the podcast, which are always so fascinating to me. Um, but I want to ask you specifically in this past year in 2023, which I cannot believe we're already at the end of the year, oh. um, it just flew by. What special things came up for you this year, whether it's in your podcast or in your work or, or something else. Uh, it could be even you know, personal, whatever it is that you feel were like your, your milestones this year, we want to hear about. Yeah, I had a big milestone this year in my podcast. I actually reached my 300th episode. And if that <laughs> wasn't a big enough milestone, my guest for my 300th episode, and of course, I only interview FBI agents. My guest was the current director of the FBI, Christopher Ray. And what is so mind blowing about that? If you look him up, you'll see he hasn't oh, done yeah. any podcast. You know, he and if you count NPR or Fox News, where they turned a news clip into an episode. Okay, maybe he was on their podcast, but any other podcast, he hasn't done one. So when they agreed for him to be a guest on my show, it was like, what? <laughs> you know, it was one of those things where you just ask and you think they're going to say no. And then when they say yes, you think to yourself, what have I done? But uh, it was a fantastic episode, very well received, and a great way to celebrate my 300th episode milestone. Yeah, it was. What a great get, right? <laughs> so <laughs> Absolutely. How, how long, how, was it was it a process? Did you ask like a long time ago, or was it something that just came out of the blue? It was a, a little bit of a process. It took about um, a month of me answering questions and saying, Sending them in, you know, verifications of my show numbers and things like that before they said yes. But from the very beginning, I was getting positive vibes because I had met him before. Um, two years ago, I was awarded the FBI Agents Association, which is like the uh, union for active agents. They gave me their G-Man Honors uh, Distinguished Service Award. And part of that was going to this gala in Washington, D.C., where I got to sit next to Christopher Ray, the FBI director. And during that time period, I talked about the podcast. I got it because of the podcast, because of telling these positive FBI stories. So I got to sit next to him and I showed him how to listen to podcasts. And, you know, I uh, got him to subscribe oh, to mine. <laughs> so he already knew about me and he knew that I was doing this positive stuff for the FBI. So they were interested from the very beginning, but it wasn't a definite deal until about a month uh, after I, I requested it. But boy, did I prepare for that one. Yeah, <laughs> just a little <laughs> bit nerve wracking, maybe I would think. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you wanted to get it right. Yeah. <laughs> so how, how did you find him as far as an interviewee? How, how was that for you? He was fantastic. He took the time to answer the questions. And sometimes I pushed back a little bit because I wanted more and he gave me more. Uh, he was very personable. You know, it was it was just everything that I thought the interview would be. It was that and more. It was just, a, a, I don't know. It was a mic drop moment, <laughs> I should say. <laughs> but I don't know if uh, there's going to be anything as far as a, a guest, that's going to top that. Yeah. I've been just thinking about the last year in general, but you know, the last couple of years, it's just been so wild. I mean, so much going on. I mean, politically, nationally, oh, yeah. uh, you know, just in the news. And of course you specifically about, you know, these federal, uh, you know, crime cases and things. 
what is something that stands out for you? Maybe either with something you covered or something you were just following or, or knew about, or came back to your attention this year, for some reason, as far as a case um, this year, what is it that stands out for you in 2023? Well, on my show, and uh, I do all kinds of cases, not just murder and violent crime, but, you know, public corruption and drug cases and white collar. And the one case that really stood out to me that was in the public this year was Sam Bankman Freed. He was the uh, CEO of the FTX, the cryptocurrency um, agency or whatever, whatever it's called. Uh, and he was arrested last year in November and was on trial this year in November for misappropriating $8 billion. I didn't say million. I said $8 billion. And so everybody was following that case, you know, and, and I was too, because, you know, in my career as an FBI agent, I concentrated or specialized in economic crime. So when somebody is arrested and charged with fraud involving an $8 billion scheme, you know, my eyes perk up and I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated, you know, how that happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And this is one person who committed this. Is that is that correct? well? He had a huge, you know, corporation of cryptocurrency. You know, he was taking in investors. He also had lots of other smaller companies, and one of them, uh, Alameda Research, actually was integral in this fraud because they were commingling funds, and many of the investors had no idea that this was going on. And once they found out, you know, they had invested uh, their cryptocurrency. Once they found out, they all started pulling back their money, you know, making requests and everything crashed. And he was he was considered uh, a billionaire, of course. But Forbes had him listed as the 41st richest American. And he was hobnobbing with all the top people. He was giving out um, political campaign financing. Everybody knew who he was. He was in the news all the time. I, of course, was always suspicious because <laughs> I'm just a very <laughs> skeptical person. But, you know, when this thing crashed and all of these people were losing money and filing for bankruptcy, it was just, it was just wild. It covered the news. And the next part of this is his sentencing. Everybody wants to know what kind of sentence he's going to get. Right, oh, he right. was found guilty. Let me just make sure I make sure <laughs> I say that. But, you know, how do you even, I mean, have you ever heard of, of, of that kind of fraud for, in that large of an amount? Is there anything close to that? You know, I don't know. What was Bernie Madoff? I yeah, really should, I, I should have looked that up to see. I, I mean, don't I, think because when you said eight billion, it's like my 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 head blew up. So I was like, "What did I hear you wrong?" Yeah, he might have been. I'm just guessing, but he might have been like two or three billion. Right. But this is eight now. Just like in the case of Bernie Madoff, many of these investors are going to get some of their money back. Maybe not their initial. Maybe not what they thought they were going to earn as far as, you know, these investments, but at least their initial investment back because of what they call clawback, where people that benefit it are asked to return uh, their money to pay off investors who, who lost. And so, you know, but he's still the fraud that isn't just because they got their money back doesn't mean he didn't defraud or misappropriate eight billion dollars. And I just have to keep saying that over and over again. You know, these cases are so fascinating, I think, because just like, I mean, if, if you, you know, can equate it to something like a, like a, a multiple murder or something like that, but this is of course, you know, a different thing, but it's also, you still wonder like what causes them to become, I imagine you start off as a legitimate person, <laughs> business person or whatever, and then go into, you know, not only, huh, it's a little easy to make, you know, to get some extra money here to, to doing something, a, a fraud on that scale. Like, what is it in there? I mean, 
from all of the, these kinds of things you've covered, I mean, even as, as an, an agent when you were working in the field and, and now, you know, at interviewing other people and researching all these cases, have you come to any conclusion about what you see that may kind of tell us, like, do we all have, like, of course, do we all have this, this, you know, like, uh, this weakness in us that if, if it comes to this much money or, or power that we are all susceptible to that? Or do you think there's a certain personality type or have you come to any conclusions about that? Like who gets involved in this kind of thing? I think the bottom line is ego because you're right. Most of these businesses that we're talking about, especially with FTX, with uh, Sam Bankman fried and with Theranos, with Elizabeth uh, Holmes, they were legitimate at first. I mean, they were businesses uh, that were working and they were getting investors and everything was fine. And then there, they, they were having investment problems and issues. And instead of throwing up their hand and saying, hey, this isn't working, um, investors, here's the truth of what's happening, they start trying to hide it. And it becomes like one big ball and it keeps rolling and rolling and rolling of lies and deception. And because of their ego, especially when you're put on a pedestal, you know, and people are thinking, oh, you're so young and so smart and, you know, so successful. And you don't want to get, you don't want to climb down off of that pedestal. That's, that's the bottom line. And so they start lying and defrauding. And next thing you know, things have gotten so far out of control and, here comes the FBI to, <laughs> to tell you yeah. that it's time to time to stop. It's very interesting to me. It's that's that's one of the reasons I love your show is because you do kind of get behind when you're listening to these stories about the 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 psychology behind it, you know, of who who does this and why and kind of pulling that apart a little bit. Yeah. And I guess when you get really at that level, when you're making that kind of crazy, stupid money then your head gets so big and your mind gets, you know, so crazy that you don't want to let it go. You don't want to lose it. You know, you don't want to crash to the ground and be, you know, like everybody else. It really is fascinating. I, I am always fascinated by fraud. It just really, really makes me wonder what people say to themselves to make it okay to steal other people's money. It's amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. It's a, a whole nother thing there. That's really, really interesting. So the last question though for you is 2024. Let's 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 kind of predict. So what do you see coming up for you or anything, um, you know, anything on the horizon for you or for FBI retired case file review or anything else you're you're doing in your life? Well, I uh, you know, have a new literary agent. And so I'm gonna try in 2024 to get back to writing crime novels. Uh, you know, I um now that I have uh an agent, I'm gonna, you know, get down behind my keyboard and try to get out some some good stories. Uh they won't be out in 2024 because that's not how the pub that's the publishing world a traditional publishing doesn't work that fast but i'll be working you know to to get those novels done uh because that was the original idea of me doing the podcast was to get people interested in right and uh reading my book so the ones that are already out i hope they still uh pick those up because the a book is always new to someone who hasn't read it but i am going to be continuing with the podcast i have some great guests coming up and uh, I will also be, you know, getting back uh, to writing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so tell I think probably the best way people to find everything that you're doing, including the podcast and the books would be your website. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, that's the home for everything. The website is jerrywilliams.com and that's J-E-R-R-I williams.com. And that's uh, where they'll find everything. Great. Yeah. And we'll definitely have the links in the show notes. So you guys can, you know, if you didn't get a chance to write that down, you just go down the show notes and find that, click on it, find all the Jerry stuff. It's, I mean, it's just, it's, she's got 300 shows, you guys. <laughs> so yes, you're, you're that, there's gotta be something that there that uh, <laughs> your, your listeners will enjoy. 
exactly especially over this you know this this holiday break that we're that we're having right now um that's coming up from for a lot of people if you're looking for something to do you got plenty right there plus books you just got books my god if you like to read books. there you go <laughs> the great <laughs> gifts too i'd say because i've read them so. <laughs> yes. thank you thank you so much all right. Thank you so much, Jerry, for being on the show. And I wish you luck and, and blessings in the, the coming year and for you and your whole family. Same to you and same to everyone listening. Happy mm -hmm. holidays. My final guest is a fairly new friend of mine but I feel like I've known him forever. When Eric and I met in person at CrimeCon for the first time, we instantly clicked. His podcast, True Consequences, covers cases of missing and murdered people in the state of New Mexico. He is an advocate for justice and a voice for the voiceless. His nonprofit, Angels Voices, is an organization dedicated to providing families with resources and referrals to help advocate for their missing or murdered loved ones. He has a huge heart, and he is funny as hell, too. I love Eric, and I know you will as well. I am now joined by my good friend and another great partner in crime, Eric, from True Consequences Podcast. Hey, Eric, how are you doing? I'm doing good, Esther. Thanks for having me on today. I'm super happy to be here. Yeah, I was excited to talk to you because we have had some... Um, some fun actually had some crime cons and mm -hmm. uh, we were in London together. That was cool. And uh, yeah, you guys, I don't know um, if you're listening to true consequences, but you've been doing it. How long now, Eric, how long you've been um, with doing the, your podcast? I just hit four years in October. Holy crap. Is that really? Jeez. Time freaking flies, right? It really does. So, uh, yeah. Four years. That's awesome. So there's plenty of episodes um, Eric does a, a great job and he really does, uh, you know, look at some of these cases that maybe you probably haven't heard about, uh, from his, his home state of New Mexico, some, um, unsolved things as well as some investigations. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. I, uh, primarily consider my show to be an advocacy focused true crime podcast. So really I, I wanted to create a show that would help to, bring a voice to families that are fighting for justice in New Mexico and to help provide them a platform, but also to speak to the unique um, legal implications that we have here, the unique cultures that we have here. A lot of that intersects and creates um, an interesting environment where some really interesting cases come up. And, you know, there's there's plenty of opportunity here to advocate for for justice. So I've made it my mission to try to help my community that way. Yeah, so it's it's a really great show, you guys. If you're not listening, you definitely need to subscribe. So, but we need to wrap up 2023. So there's right. two questions I have for you. Number one is I want to know for you or for two, True Consequences, what was 2023? What was what was there like a, a milestone that you hit or um or any special events? Anything special that happened for you or the podcast in 2023? Well, this is a long list, so I'll try to consolidate it as much as I can. But a lot happened in 2023. Um, True Consequences won the Listener's Choice Award at the True Crime yeah, Awards in there. London. You were there. You were there. That was I awesome. I have pictures, so it happened. <laughs> that, that was a great time. I got to hang out with you and Tyler and Justin and, and all of our friends there. Um, I hit a million downloads, which was really exciting. Oh, uh, it took me four years to get there, but I got there eventually. Um, and then I launched my nonprofit and uh, as well as my advocacy conference. So a lot of big milestones this year, a lot of cool things happening. And I'm really excited for 2024. Yeah, that, that's amazing. Um, second question, because I'm, I'm always looking for for things like, you know, things that pop up or whatever in my peripheral where I can say, well, you know, I need to, I need to check that out or I need to learn about that. And of course, you know, we're all kind of into true crime or something that's like true crime or something that we just get obsessed with, right? Um, that we really want to follow or learn about or watch or whatever. What was that one story for you, Eric, in um, 2023, as far as what it is that you could not stop thinking about, talking about, you know, or just learning about? 
there's so much that happened in 2023 from a true crime perspective. I mean, we've got somebody arrested in the Delphi murders. We've got uh, the Murdoch case. Like so much was going on in 2023. But, and I'm going to go way off into left field using a sports analogy that I know nothing about and say <laughs> <laughs> that uh, I've been obsessed with this potential cult that I've learned about in um the fall of this year have you ever heard of the garden no oh my god oh my god (laughs) okay okay go on i'm excited now (laughs) okay have you heard of the rainbow gathering or the rainbow family it kind of sounds familiar but i'm not i'm not that familiar with it okay so i'm gonna kind of go a little bit off track and then i'm gonna circle back here um, so the Rainbow Gathering is like a group of hippies, I guess, is the best way for me to describe them. They probably would not like me saying that, but it's major- <laughs> the majority of them are hippies. I've actually been to a Rainbow Gathering here in New Mexico, and it's oh, wow. it's like a mini um, Woodstock, but without musicians. It's a lot of <laughs> drum circles and a lot of drugs and a lot of dancing naked in the rain. Okay. And- <laughs> yeah. So it's like one of those kind of things. So the rainbow movement, they call themselves the rainbow family. Uh, the idea is that you all come together and everybody works. Everybody helps out with the camp. You know, there's people that are cooking. There's people that are procuring the food. There's people that, you know, have different things to offer and you barter. And so like there's even artisans and you can barter for whatever you have. Like if you have food, you might be able to get a necklace or something. It's it's a really fascinating kind of social study. And uh, the idea of like this whole commune lifestyle, it lasts about a weekend usually. Okay, so the garden cult or commune, there's a documentary on Max, which is kind of what tipped me off to this. It's not really a documentary, though. I would call it more like a reality show. Um <laughs> so they started out in Tennessee and it was Tennessee. This, wow. okay. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah, it's unexpected. You like California or yeah, Oregon. Even, even Colorado, maybe, right? Like yeah. yeah, but they're in Tennessee. They have 22 acres of land in the middle of nowhere. And they are all kind of birth from this idea of like the rainbow family where everybody contributes to the well-being of the community and nobody goes hungry nobody needs anything really as long as you're like actively participating um and it's all very like egalitarian and very um kind of democratic where Mm -hmm. everybody has to come together to agree and even if one person doesn't agree on a decision then it doesn't happen So they have this thing where they do like voting, but they do 10 seconds of silence to signify consent. So as long as nobody says anything in that 10 seconds, the motion will pass, whatever that is. Um, So I don't really remember the guy's name. Patrick is his name now. I I see it here. Patrick Martian, not M-A-R-T-I-A-N, M-A-R-T-I-O-N. Maybe it's Marshone. Um, but he's kind of like, he says he's not a leader. He says he's like, just kind of this guy that had this great idea and everybody is leading the group together, but he also is not involved in like the day-to-day decisions directly, which is weird. Um, it does seem like he's involved indirectly. Like he has his people that if he doesn't want something to pass, he tells them to speak up. So that, that's kind of why I was giving you the heads up on how the voting works, because it's a little bit of a weird situation. But there's this guy named, I'm not even kidding, his nickname is Tree. Okay. He's from Liverpool, England, and he ended up in this like commune in Tennessee. And he started to see like TikTok as a viable opportunity to market the cult. Um, I mean, because we're all trying to make it on TikTok, right? Like everybody in the world <laughs> is trying to make it on TikTok, even cults. <laughs> so oh, wow careful out there <laughs> on tiktok <laughs> <laughs> so he's like you know check out our chickens and check out our compost and look at our composting toilet and oh like here's all the people making food for us and you guys should come out and so they opened up the doors to the commune to everybody and on the internet 
and it started to go viral. Well, as anybody who searches into true crime or is interested by this kind of stuff, like the web sleuths started looking into it. They're like, what, what's up with this, this group? Like, it seems really weird that they're just, you know, inviting all these people, randos to come from TikTok to come and live on their farm. Um, yeah. So they uncover like all this stuff. They uncover the fact that I guess there was a cat that was hunting chickens on the farm. So they shot the cat. And because they're very much like granola, hippy dippy, like not wanting to be wasteful, they wanted to try to use the cat. This is going to be a trigger warning for people yeah. who are animal lovers, by the way. La, 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 if you're a cat lover. <laughs> yeah, if you're a cat lover, maybe skip ahead a few seconds. But they tried to cook the cat. Oh, God. They tried to eat the cat, um, but nobody liked it. So then they took the fur and made it into a hat. <laughs> Down. Who wore the hat? Was it a commu community it's, hat? It, well, I <laughs> think there was one woman, the woman who made the hat. She's she's the one that wears it and, and like was saying like, oh, yeah, it just straps perfectly on my head. So that's why I wear it. Shades um, of Eddie. <laughs> yeah, it's a little I mean, it's a lot su suspect. <laughs> it's a lot sketch. Yeah. Um, so people start saying, oh my God, this is a cult because it, it is weird. It is weird. Um, it's uh, it definitely on the fringes of society and what, you know, normal, not, I hate to say normal, but like what the mainstream society does not live that way. Right. They don't, mo most people don't. Um, so <laughs> So they start going viral, but now for the wrong reasons, because mm -hmm. not for the reasons they want to, because they are like totally unironically marketing themselves for people to come. And now there's like this backlash and social media is like they're a cult. They're like controlling people. Um, and so then the, the group members start getting like death threats and people start like doxing them and posting their information online and then it just gets kind of escalated and gets out of control like these things often do. So th they close the commune off. So this is like mm -hmm. in 2021, they close it off. They're like, forget it. We're not inviting anybody over here. We're just going to be happy living our own life. Well, they get uh, child protective services called on them. Animal control gets called on them. Just people online are just constantly like sending people over there. So they get sick of it. And they move to Missouri. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they kind of spin it in this way, like, oh, well, we're still going to have Tennessee, but we're going to start like seeding communes all around the, yeah, around the country. And like their goal is really to get, get more members. So I think it was like last year they started ramping up their TikTok campaign again to get people to come, but they came up with a new kind of process so the process is you can stay for 10 days and then we vote and decide if you're going to stay long term mm. but you have to give up like your house and you know like you have to give up all that stuff unless you just like own your house outright and have somebody take care of it because now you're living on a farm so it's kind of like you're you're into this forced isolation even though it is voluntary which is how most cults work right Right. Um, so the series kind of picks up where they're getting ready to move from Tennessee to Missouri and they have all these new people coming in and they're, they're all different. Like there's one woman who thinks she's a shaman. Um, I don't know if she is, but she says that she is. So we'll just assume that she is, I guess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she does not look like what I would expect a shaman to look like, but that's okay. Um, there's a guy who's a prepper of course, because you always have to have those people. Um, there's another woman who's a prepper. And then there's like this other guy who believes that it's the end of the world. Not to say that it isn't because it does kind of feel like it is right now, but he <laughs> believes that it's the end of the world. And, but he doesn't know how to survive. And he has this family and he wants to take care of them. So he wants to learn how to like survive so that if like the shit hits the fan, he can take care of his family. Um, so it all like they pass it off as a documentary, but I'm telling you, Esther, it is like reality TV. Oh, okay. TV. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> their, their lives and what, 
what's going on behind the scenes kind of thing, right? Exactly, exactly. And it's all kind of framed up in a certain direction. So it's hard to know how much of this, like, it's hard to know what's really going on at this commune, because I feel like what we, what I saw in that series was probably very planned out, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'm trying to picture it. So these, these people that are in this, this, you know, this family or whatever they want to call it, mm-hmm. like, if they were walking around just on the streets of, you know, wherever, Tennessee, would they mm-hmm. look, would they fit in or do they look different from other people? They look different. I mean, they're mm-hmm. all living outside. They're all living off the grid. There's no electricity. There's no running water. Um, <clears throat> so everything, like they have a gravity shower. They have a trench that they use the restroom in. Um, <laughs> they're living in converted buses and tents and like lean tos and just whatever they can make is what they're living in. So um, they don't shower often. I mean, the guy tree was very proud of the fact that he only showers once a month. Um, (laughs) So, (laughs) yeah. So like, you know, they're, they're obviously like, they've got grimy fingers and they're digging in the dirt and stuff. And I'm sure they don't smell great. Uh, Their clothes are, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> their clothes are very I'm not being judgmental I'm just saying like if you only shower once a month as an American that could be difficult for people um yeah you know um but their clothes are all very like handmade hippie style so they don't okay. they wouldn't necessarily fit in they would definitely stand out uh, on a street yeah. for sure I definitely need you to watch because I want to see what this with this encampment or whatever you want to call it looks like you know because I can imagine I just it just sounds very random you know, it, it doesn't is. sound, it's, it doesn't sound like, you know, Jonestown planning kind of thing. You know what I mean? It just doesn't sounds like there's definitely, you know, everybody come bring your tent. You know, <laughs> it, it is very tent. much, it is very much yeah. that. So they're all very paranoid in this compound. Like they're all convinced that the FBI is out to get them. The CIA is out to get them. Like they think that, you know, the, they could potentially have like a raid situation just because they're so paranoid and they're all convinced that the world is ending as well, which is why I think it is a cult, right? Cause that's like kind of one of the main markers of a cult is like a doomsday cult in particular. Do you have like this dogma about the world ending and then your leader or leadership is going to tell you how to survive it. They're going to teach you. They're going to help you and guide you and protect you. All you have to do is move here and do everything yeah. exactly the way we tell you to do it. Otherwise, you're out. But here's here's a question I thought I just this popped into my mind. For you personally, Eric, yeah. if yeah. you were ever to join a cult, what would it have to look like? What would have to be included in that cult for you to feel like, yeah, these are my people and I can hang here? All right. So <laughs> I don't know if this is surprising to you or not, but I've thought about this a lot. <laughs> why that popped in my head i must have known that somehow just just intuitively knew that about you eric (laughs) (laughs) well so first of all i've always said i've wanted to start a cult because there's no money in being a member like you have to you have to be at the top if you want the money and (laughs) so i want the money um so i would definitely want to start a cult but like i think for me to actually join a cult there would definitely have to be like tacos um <laughs> of course <laughs> tacos and puppies and <laughs> soft bed and no a soft outside. bed yeah yeah i don't mind sleeping outside i love camping actually i could sleep outside okay um yeah, yeah. i think those are you, are you talking glamping or are you talking camping no i actually like sleep on the ground in a tent oh there you go okay yeah so you're you're a man of the earth <laughs> I, I am i could actually i think you know could potentially fall into something like this because um <laughs> because i really what would, lo- the, what, would the, what would the sales pitch be what would the to, sales pitch be for your cult for my cult tacos mm-hmm. and puppies what else do you have to say <laughs> <laughs> but they'd have to do something they'd have to be to be part of it what would that be would they have to bring to the group i guess um some skills right so you definitely want people that can work for free for you so that you can Mm -hmm. build your massive empire off of their like labor (laughs) 
<laughs> and are they selling things? Or are you guys like like uh, just having converts that are giving up their possessions, you know, kind of thing? Because there's those two two different kinds, right? I mean, most of the time they're converts giving up the possessions, but then sometimes there's also like a program like that you have to you have to buy to yeah. you know to be involved. There's definitely going to be a brainwash weekend for sure. <laughs> um, it's only seven ninety nine, so it's not that bad. <laughs> it includes you your food it. includes your food and your your uh tacos. Taco yeah your, ta- your tacos and your <laughs> mat to sleep on <laughs> <laughs> and there will be a shower i think yeah i think there's there definitely going to be a shower yeah for sure <laughs> for sure um but this i don't know like i kept going back and forth as i was watching it like i don't know is it a commune is it a cult and that's actually the name of of the show it's the garden commune or cult and i think like it, I think it might be both. And even the rainbow gathering has like its problems. They're on the FBI watch list. Like the, you know, they they came to be anarchists. There's just like, there's all this stuff that, that is problematic with the rainbow gathering. And this is just kind of, kind of adjacent to that. It's it's, it does definitely sound like a reality show. Mm-hmm. And it also sounds like, um yeah, that was that show where you get voted off the Island kind of thing. Like survivor. Um, survivor yeah like survivor mm-hmm. just that's that's weird a survive survivor cult but not in the way you think right <laughs> right right i definitely now have that on my list to watch any less uh, thoughts coming into the new year about you know you or the podcast maybe talked a little bit about it but anything really exciting on the radar for true consequences or are you personally in the next year um for true consequences i think one of the things that's going to probably end up happening is I'm probably going to bring it into the nonprofit as a, a means to help families that are fighting for justice. So the nonprofit Angels Voices Silence No More grants funds to families that are looking for their missing loved ones or fighting for justice uh, to pay for things like therapy, uh, private investigations, DNA testing. We pay for funeral expenses, uh, anything that they may need, billboards to help them you know, we'll pay for search parties, whatever, whatever we can do to help. We'll also be using true consequences to help them uh, tell their stories and, you know, both the good and, and the the difficult stories when things are, are wrapping up and they're getting justice and, and we're, we're helping them with that. So I think we're going to see true consequences kind of shift a little bit into more, more advocacy than it, than it already is. And then um, working to plan advocacy con 2025, which is a conference to help families and, and advocates who are, are out there fighting for justice to educate them, to give them access to resources, connect them with people that might be able to help them. Um, So just trying to do everything I can to, to be there for those families that are out there fighting for justice. That is so cool. That is very exciting. And it, it's, I mean, I think it really keeps you motivated to know like you have these these kind of goals or whatever. And and especially it sounds like it's it's really a, a great, you know, kind of packaged up in true consequences. And that's kind of always been your focus anyway. And now it's just kind of again, it's one of those things I was saying, like we got in 2024, everything has started to come into focus. And then you're like, now this is what it is. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that makes it so much easier. That's where the coasting comes in. It makes it so yeah. much easier because you know what you're doing and you're so motivated to do it that it just becomes like, you know, it's, it's like smooth sailing is, is the kind of the way that I feel it. So awesome. I'm so, I'm so glad to be able to talk to you again and I can't wait to see you again. We always have so much fun. Um, and some crazy times in London and <laughs> I still have fond memories of that. Um, yeah. So yeah, we definitely got to get together again soon, and I'm sure we will. I mean, we we, we cross paths all the time, and we will definitely be looking forward to that. But I will have links to um, Eric's uh, podcast as well as the uh, the nonprofit in the show notes, so you guys can go and check out more information on that. That would be amazing if you would do that f- for us. Um, and yeah, thank you so much once again for being here today. And uh, I I am just you know wishing you best holidays and uh, happy new year and great things going into 2024. I cannot, I'm excited. I'm excited for you. I really am. So I think it's going to be awesome. So thank you once again. Thank you, Esther. I'm so happy to be here and I'm excited as well. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. And that will wrap up 2023. If you're a Patreon member, we have a lot of extra content for you this month. Some bonus episodes you can listen to while you're on your holiday break. 
You'll get to watch full videos with each of my guests in this episode. I edited the discussions on this episode for time, but left them uncut for Patreon. You'll learn more about me and my guests and get more details from each of the cases we covered on this episode. We'll be releasing all of the videos on Patreon during our break. Once Upon a Crime will return on January 15th, 2024, with our regular weekly episodes. We'll also be releasing new episodes of True Crime Chisme on Patreon. Lorena and I will discuss more true crime cases on these bonus episodes and share what we're watching, listening to, and gossiping about. It's a lot of fun, and I hope you'll join us. To become a member of Patreon to watch and listen to all of our bonus content, as well as to get episodes of Once Upon a Crime ad-free and hear them before everyone else, go to patreon.com slash onceuponacrime. Memberships start at just $2 a month, and as a thank you, you'll also receive special gifts in the mail. That's patreon.com slash onceuponacrime. There's a link in the show notes. Once Upon a Crime is written and produced by me, Esther Sanchez Ludlow. My administrative and production assistant is Lorena Garcia. I want to thank all my guests one more time for contributing to today's show. Tyler from Minds of Madness, Michael from True Crime Guys, Leroy from Excuse Me That's Illegal, Jerry from FBI Retired Case File Review, and Eric from True Consequences. You can find links to their information in the show notes. I wish you all a peaceful holiday season and a very happy new year. Until 2024, be good to one another. <laughs>